Yeah. Thank you, Luke, for those very generous comments. Um, colleagues, I don't have a lot of time and there's much I want to share with you. So what I want to do is to canter through some slides and hopefully leave some space so that we can have some uh, discussion, some exchange before we have to move on. Um, what I want to do is really simple, which is to try and make some comments on the state we're in. The state we're in as a people, uh, the condition of being black in British society in this moment, and the nation state that we're in and what it is dumping upon us. So I've chosen to call this presentation, Living with the Hostile Environment, when collective silence equals complicity. Uh, and, and the reason for that I'm sure would, would, would become evident as, as we proceed. Next one, please. I want to begin with this quotation, well, two quotations separated by about a hundred years, but each reinforces the other really. This one by Malcolm X. Anytime you live in a society supposedly based upon law and it doesn't enforce its own laws because of the color of a man's skin uh, happens to be wrong, then I say those people are justified to resort to any means necessary to bring about justice when the government can't give them justice. And followed, following that immediately, uh, that guru of mine, someone whose writings and whose life um, I, I consider a, a, a constant inspiration, Frederick Douglass, find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. I want to keep. I want you to keep that particularly in your consciousness as I go through uh, the next set of slides. So my first comment is this: Really, um, I, I, I have always find, found it ironic that racism and xenophobia runs in the DNA of the British nation. Um, a nation who went around the world um, without so much as a buy your leave, employing genocide, massacres, rape, uh, and to, to, to absolve it all, um, the omnipresent, omnipresent Bible, and particularly uh, Christianity from the major religions in, 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 in the UK. And talking about massacres and rape, et cetera, I think it's important that we remind ourselves that all empires sustain themselves and expand through barbarism, whatever empire it is, the Ottoman Empire, the Roman Empire, uh, whatever. Um, and the British Empire was no exception to that. Now, that's not just a throwaway point. Um, the point I'm wanting to make through that is to suggest that that barbarism and, and, and all its consequences for those who suffered it, um, it doesn't simply go away. It retains, it remains in people's DNA uh, for generations afterwards. And, 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 and we must take that into account when we consider our present condition and the way in which that barbarism diminished us as a people and diminished the, the countries and the people uh, to, to, to which we belonged before we were enslaved. Imperialism and colonialism served to define this nation and its people's view of themselves and the place in the world. Um, it was the crucible, therefore, in which racism was constructed. Next. 
So in the light of all of that, my, my, my thesis is that if Britain wished to project itself as a modern post-imperial nation, even if none of its former colonial subjects came here, it needed to confront the legacy of empire and deconstruct whiteness, especially through schooling and education as part of the social structure. It needed to own up to the barbarism it had imposed upon the majority in its own population as defined by class, by gender, by ethnic nationality, while at the same time manipulating them to focus upon what made them superior to people like us with black and brown skin. But the country continues to promote the belief in whiteness as normative, invincible, and as bestowing the right to belong to the in-group of humanity and to be superior to all other humanoids. And, and, and that's basically been at, at the very core, the essence of British imperialism and colonialism. And of course, we know the consequences of that. If you're white, you're all right. If you're black, stay back. Consequently, we live in a society which validates white people automatically while requiring black people to prove ourselves before we could be thought competent, accepted, capable of fitting in and worthy to be included. And, and, and if, we, if we understand what that means, we then understand why the whole notion of black and ethnic minority remains so toxic. In my view, all of that, that imperial and colonial past required Britain to embrace a particular imperative. And that was to promulgate, to deliver education for liberation. Um, if it was going to save itself, if it was going to not repeat the, 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 the iniquities of the past, it needed to embrace that concept and operationalize it, expunging racism from the DNA of the nation, righting racial wrongs, first of all, acknowledging before you can right racial wrongs, cultivating a non-racial mindset in its own population, and building a culture of equity that took account of both race and class. Next one. My guru, Paulo Freire, uh, that educationalist who is perhaps the most important such person that we've had in the globe had this to say. Education does not change society. Education changes people. People change society. So what you do with education and how you position it to change people then becomes very important, which is why we must have a concern about what goes on in schooling and education around, around this country now and for the last uh, 70 plus years. Now, this is an important quote from uh, CLR James. And if you haven't read that book, The Future and the Present, you really should. He's talking about Leonard Lyle, um, writing in a chapter entitled British Barbarism in Jamaica, support the Negro workers' struggle. And Lyle had this to say, I cannot believe that I was unsound in stating that the West Indian laborer does not remotely resemble the English laborer. And this is what James says in retort. 
Tate and Lyle make a fortune every year by selling to the British workers sugar grown by Jamaican workers. They must keep these two, Jamaican workers and British workers, divided at all costs. Hence, with that shameless, shamelessness so characteristic of British capitalism, Lyle discovers that the West Indies laborer does not remotely resemble the English laborer. Next one, please. The real trouble is, of course, that he resembles the English laborer too much for Mr. Capitalist Lyle. In this article, first published in 1938, James is calling on the British workers in their unions, the organized labor movement, to press for full democratic rights for the West Indian workers. He says, Tate and Lyle are planning to open factories in Jamaica. They want to take advantage of labor, which has not the right to, to, as yet to protect itself. Thus, black is used against white and Leonard Lyle seeks to poison the mind of the British worker against the West Indian worker. And again, if you have not read this book available from New Beacon Books in Stroud Green Road, 76 Stroud Green Road in, in Finsbury Park, then you should. Because in order for us to understand our positionality as Caribbean people coming from a reserved pool of labor in the Caribbean in, after the Second World War, we must understand what Arthur Lewis is writing about in terms of that period from, from that, that great depression in the, in the middle 1920s to the period leading up to the start of the Second World War in 1939. And this is a quote from Lewis talking about the Caribbean. The white population is relatively small, averaging about 3% of the total. This tiny white element dominates every aspect of West Indian life, 3%. Economically and politically, the white man is supreme. He owns the biggest plantations, stores, and banks, controlling directly and indirectly the entire economic life of the community. A number of factors have contributed to increase the political consciousness of the Caribbean West Indian workers. Foremost, it is the Italian conquest of Abyssinia. West Indians felt that in, in that issue, the British government betray, betrayed a nation because it was black. And this has tended to destroy the faith in white government and to make them more willing to take the faith in their own hands. And Arthur Lewis, of course, was absolutely right. The British worker, whose experience of the West Indian worker, Whitehall and, and Mr. Leonard Lyle sought to deny, had established a position of strength through their organized uh, labor movement and was wielding some bargaining power. After two devastating wars in 30 years, 1914 to 18, 1939 to 45, they determined that things were not to be the same anymore. And my thesis is that it is precisely that position of strength which those different workers from the colonies were introduced to undermine. The 1956 visit of London Transport to Barbados to set up a recruitment center through the good offices of the Barbados Immigration Service was not altogether unconnected with the industrial action London Transport had been experiencing at that time. And so it is within that context where that we have to locate, situate state racism in Britain and what I call the hegemony of language. Four generations after that reserved pool of labor started to arrive here. The descendants of those who arrived in 1948 
and in the decades that followed, are still labeled ethnic minorities and potentially illegal immigrants. And that's an issue I shall return to later in this presentation. So as, as, as you will remember, hopefully, the ban, the beat the ban hike in the number of migrants arriving in the UK in advance of the 1962 Commonwealth Immigrants Act was as follows. 1959, 21,550. 1960, 58,300, more than double. 1961, again, more than double, 125,400. People being, what's the word, hemorrhaged, if you like, from the Caribbean, uh, a reserved pool of labor that the British had left unsupported without any industries, without any employment to absorb that labor, but whom they, whom they hung on to because we all, we all held passports reading citizen of the British, of the United Kingdom, and colonies. That is what enabled us to come here legitimately, justifiably, as citizens in the period before and after 1948. But by 1965, the Labour Party, and I'll say lots more about them in a minute, was saying this. One of the worst Home Secretaries of all time, Roy Hattersley, was pronouncing that without integration of us into British life, limitation, in other words, racialized immigration, was not excusable. But without limitation, racialized immigration, integration was impossible. And he states, it's, it's not been easy, to, it's not been a, an easy decision to take that 1965 um, immigration legislation, the honorable but mistaken opposition to the 1961 immigration legislation has made it much more difficult, but the cause of integration will be well served. So he is, a, he is therefore um, legitimizing, justifying the, the additional constraints that were put in 1965, building upon 1962, by suggesting that you needed to limit the number of people coming in um, um, uh, in order to, to ensure and secure the immigration, the integration of those who were already here. So the 1965 Race Relations Act made discrimination on the grounds of color, race, ethnic or national origins illegal in public places, except in Northern Ireland. Um, it was the first legislation in the UK since 1948 or ever to tackle racial discrimination. That was repealed by the 1968 Act, which additionally prohibited discrimination in housing, employment, and the provision of goods and services. Next. But that didn't come from nowhere. The 1968 Act was the, result, the direct result of the work of the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination, CARD. CARD was an interracial body of activists. It was founded by David Pitt, a Grenadian like myself, a GP unlike myself, who later became Lord Pitt of Hampstead, having failed to win election as a Labour MP the Labour voters would have none of it. Um, and he was joined by others, including Anthony Lester, uh, QC, uh, Eric Lubbock, Lord Avebury of the Liberal Party, and, an, and, 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 and a number of others. Next. So what did Card do? Card went around gathering evidence of 
how black people were being discriminated against. And I was one of those taking part in, 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 in that fact finding. So white and black, a white and black uh, a pair would go after the same job or after rented accommodation or whatever. Um, uh, the black person would be told the, 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 the position has been filled, the room has gone, and the white person, their, their, their counterpart, would apply literally five, 10, 15 minutes later and be told, yes, you can come. Uh, we will interview you this evening, start on Monday, or the, the room is still available. This is how much it would cost. And, 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 and you can come and um, pay your deposit or whatever. So we collected overwhelming evidence of racial discrimination in those respects, including trying to go and book a room in a hotel or, 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 or to get some services from from, from some other service provider. Next. Next. So Steve, could you go back one or two? Good. Um, um, the, I, I want to make the point and stress the point that the 1965 Immigration Act position Britain on a spectrum. And, 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 and I'm, I'm saying all of this because what I'm trying to do is to paint the backcloth to the hostile environment. That didn't arise um, um, uh, immediately, suddenly, uh, 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 without context after 2010. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to, 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 to remind us that it had its origins ever since 1962, and particularly that act in 1965. I am saying that the state positioned itself on the one hand, espousing liberal notions of the value and richness of diversity, ethnic diversity, while passing increasingly racist immigration legislation. And then on the other hand, the far right wanting to keep Britain white with the political parties oscillating between the center and the far right. In other words, the far right was the extreme end of what the people whom we elected, the conservative government, the labor government were themselves doing. And, and of course, it was, it was on the one hand, the benign form of racist oppression with all these laws and everything apparently working in a consensual way with the consent of the electorate. And on the other hand, these neo-fascists going around nigger hunting, packy bashing, murdering black people and people from the Indian subcontinent at will without the state interfering or intervening. So to come to 2016, I am arguing that if you want to understand Brexit and how Farage pushed Cameron and Theresa May to hold a referendum on leaving the EU, you just have to look at the, the way successive governments since 1962 have racialized immigration by conflating race and immigration and passed dracon draconian laws in every iteration to appease racists and fascists. As you will recall in 2013, Theresa May, Home Secretary at the time, had vans running around London boroughs with billboards screaming, go home or face arrest. In doing so, she cast a veil of suspicion over the entire black and global majority population of the country, rendering us all, all of us, potential illegal immigrants, and as such the targets of anyone any, any would-be racist and neo-fascist who felt it was their duty to help the government curb immigration. Because they had form, 
They've been doing that kind of stuff for decades. The government didn't proscribe the National Front. It didn't proscribe Column 88. It didn't proscribe the, the British National Party. And they went around murdering people at will and with impunity. So 2016, the Immigration Act, following the 2014 Immigration Act was passed by royal assent on the 12th of May. It marked the beginning of what came to be known as the Windrush generation being oppressed by the British state in a manner that simply mirrored what they were doing during the days of slavery and the plantation system. Um, the Windrush generation was to experience a, lo a loss of liberty, a loss of life as a result of the strictures of that 2016 um, um, legislation. By having these vans going around saying, go home and face arrest, May was laying the foundations of a hostile environment before she and the parliament even introduced the 2014 and 2016 legislation, which led to deni the denial of healthcare, loss of employment and of housing for the so-called Windrush generation. So people who had been here for years, attended the same doctor's surgery for 20, 30, 40 years, were suddenly told, we can't treat you anymore because we have been informed by the Home Office that you are illegal and, and you are not entitled to these services anymore. Let's move on. So in my book, therefore, those 13 people or more who have lost their lives as a direct result of May's hostile environment and what I call persecution, because I, I, I can't think of any other fitting term for it, persecution by the state, are no less the victims of racist murders than if they had been individually killed by neo-fascists. And I think, I think we need to register this point. Those people, they may have died because they were denied medication for the prostate cancer or the heart disease or the type two diabetes or whatever. But in my book, those deaths, avoidable deaths, were no less racist murders than if the National Front or the BNP or Tommy Robinson and his lot had gone and killed people by putting firebombs through the letterboxes. And that is why I called a hostile environment and its casualties and fatalities Theresa May's, Theresa May's pogrom. She, no less than Javid and the even more odious Pretty Patel, God knows, has blood on her hands. However much she might think she has washed her hands of all of that messy business and left it to Pretty Patel. So 2016, the Immigration Act is passed, bringing in an extension of the UK border force. So nursery, uh, people who run their nurseries, landlords, employers, uh, uh, Uber, Uber, firms, everybody had a legal duty to make sure that they checked that whoever it was that they were, they were employing was legitimately able to be in this country. Um, all of a sudden, the border force had all of these satellites, all of these other people acting on behalf of the British Immigration Service constituting an immigration watch, um, 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 feeding into the nativism 
that became rampant at that time, a resurgence of racism and xenophobia, which led to the murder of, of, of Joe Cox, MP for Batley and Spen in, 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 in South Yorkshire, and of course, the Brexit referendum. And about the referendum, this is what I see. The Conservative Party under Cameron and May courted UKIP and Nigel Farage and had a shotgun marriage of convenience. UKIP impregnated the Conservative government. Brexit is their offspring. And the likes of Tommy Robinson, the English Defense League, Britain First, and National Action appointed themselves wet nurse. That, that, that's the reality that we faced at that time. So against that backcloth, I am arguing that with or without the scandal of the barbar barbaric treatment of citizens from the Commonwealth who have lived all their lives in this country since 1948, we as African and Asian diaspora in Britain had absolutely no right to take part in any state-sponsored celebration of the Windrush generation's contribution to the richness and diversity of modern Britain as happened at the Westminster Abbey in June of 1948 to mark 70 years of the Windrush arriving at Tilbury Docks. None whatsoever. And to find all of these black people in the Dandan rushing to, 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 to Westminster Abbey to be there to hear uh, Theresa May, uh, Prince, whoever it is, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, representing the Queen, applaud us for coming here in such numbers without any reference to reserve pool of labor, without any reference to how denuded Britain left the Caribbean, all that stupid hype about our adding to diversity and contributing to the building of modern Britain without counting the cost, complete nonsense. And, and, and it, 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 it takes me back to what, to what Frederick Douglass was saying find out what any people would submit themselves to, and you have the exact measure of the oppression that would be heaped upon them. So against that background, what have been the defining experiences of the Windrush generation? Quickly, let's, can, let's canter through this. And you know it all. I'm just reminding us. Racial discrimination, denial of equal rights and justice, Betrayal of uh, our parents' high yeah. aspirations for their children, especially of schooling and education as a vehicle for social mobility. Stubbornly high levels of school exclusion of black boys in particular to this day. Increasingly high levels of exclusion of primary age children and scandalously of children with special educational needs and disabilities. And the government knows it, it keeps the, stati the statistics and it wants to do nothing at all about it. Disproportionate number of black students in pupil referral units and other forms of alternative provision, shunting black students into schools for the educationally subnormal. And in his introduction, uh, 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 um, um, Luke mentioned the, the, the Steve McQueen film, brilliant film on that subject. Black boys, black students, boys in particular, being seen as identified with underachievement in school and thereby framing the expectations of the low expectations of white teachers. And this pattern now being seen to be replicated even in higher education with universities being preoccupied with the attainment gap at degree level between black students and their peers. In 2007, I was asked to address 
a national conference of vice chancellors. And that's what I had to say to them. The biggest challenge for HE 14 years ago is to ensure that the grading and stratification along ethnic lines that has become so embedded at schooling level is not replicated and structuralized in higher education. So we've graduated from underachievement in school with black Caribbean boys and Roma children at the bottom to the black, the black and minority attainment gap at degree level in higher education. In spite of that, people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds have a greater higher education initial participation rate than people of white backgrounds. In other words, we aspire to and go into universities much more than people from white backgrounds. So in, the, in addition to all of that, we face the refusal to make the curriculum more relevant to young black people and indeed to white young people and more reflective of our, of our global contribution as African people, as Asian people to the evolution of knowledge. We, we experience resistance to decolonizing the curriculum, both in schooling and in further and higher education. And as I keep on saying, you can't hope to decolonizing, to decolonize the curriculum without decolonizing the institution itself. And we all familiar with this targeting of young people, boys in particular, through criminalization by the police and criminal justice system, stop and search, SUS, gratuitous harassment, police activities in schools, gang matrix, profiling, and so on. And that leads in a, inexorably, inexorably to the overrepresentation of black males in remand centers, young offender institutions, and adult prisons. Worse than that, worse than all of that, it seems as if black males in particular have demonstrated year on year for at least the last 30 years, an unnatural tendency to die of natural causes while in the custody of the British police. Deaths in custody. This tendency is accentuated when they are suffering from mental illness. And the police think that they are more responsive to the repute, repeated use of police tasers than to treatment from health professionals. Added to that is the disproportionately high unemployment rate among black school leavers and unemployment and underemployment among gra black graduates. We have lived with these unprecedented levels of youth violence. One in three murders in London involve black males below the age of 30, either as victims or as perpetrators. And there are more black people killed by other black people than by the police or and white racists after 70 years of people of my parents' generation coming to this country to provide better opportunities for those same young black people. So the state has appropriated and canonized Stephen Lawrence. It has crowned his mother, but we, we fail to ask the question, how many more of the likes of Stephen have we lost at the hands of young people like themselves? And I say this in order to say that, with good reason, we speak truth to power when necessary. And you will know that I do that all the time. But we're much less good at speaking truth to ourselves. For example, if Black Lives Matter 
why do they not seem to matter and make us outraged only when they are taken by the state and by white racists and fascists? Is the loss to our community and the additional layers of trauma bereaved families and the community suffer any less if the police or the far right kill our loved ones than if those loved ones are taken by our children themselves? Why have we not tackled the don't snitch policy that enables killers to take black lives repeatedly while we nurture them as vipers in our very bosoms. Okay, so you might think, oh God, Gus is having a downer today. He's so damn negative. Yes, we've had all of this. We've had black theater companies, people in film and television, growing number of Olympic black medalists, black premier league footballers being, being harassed and racialized and, and abused across Europe. We have black classical musicians, black MPs and lords and baronesses, <laughs> and the numbers increase, except that we can't see in any way, shape or form, what value is it to us, black police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's move on. So we have all of that. Including, including the latest edition, who managed to extricate herself, um, 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 Megan uh, uh, um, Marple, uh, the caramel face of, of, of royalty. Um, we've, we've got all of that. And yet we are still referred to and counted as minority ethnic and representative of diversity rather than being part and essential and integral part of what makes Britain what it is today. As such, we are still eligible to be targeted by those who feel that they are licensed by the hostile environment to treat non-whites as they bloody well please. In that context, let's just remember we talk about equality, diversity, and inclusion. Inclusion and the, 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 the idea of having a representative number of black people in whatever remain very pro problematic concepts, which many people fail to deconstruct. So quickly running through this again, 1926, 2016, Hostile Environment Act passes. Next, and you, you, you know all of this stuff. Next one, next one. So one of the more draconian measures of that act was the removal of those people who were considered to have no right to be here, even if they've lived, lived here for 30 and 40 and 50 years. And the more, the more draconian part of it was that those people needed to be removed before they could appeal, unless they could provide evidence that doing so would cause them serious irreversible harm or contravene their human rights. So those detainees in that horrendous place, that Alcatraz, called Yazwood Immigration Removal Center have been at the core of the Windrush scandal. Where does that come from? When in 1918, 20, sorry, 2018, um, a group of people decided to form this committee to organize the celebration at Westminster Abbey the chair of that uh, organizing committee said in the bulletin, those who came here on the Windrush in 1948 and after came seeking adventure. It is as if they were bored 
in Jamaica, bored in Antigua, bored in Grenada, and decided to don their safari suits and get on a boat, Windrush, <laughs> and come to England seeking adventure. Now, how stupid can you be to make such a statement? Recently, we've had the, the Wendy Williams report, uh, lessons to be learned from the Windrush scandal. She talked about the Home Office's institutional failings, but said that she could not, she could not say categorically that they were institutionally racist, um, that those who operate immigration laws, 2014, 2016, immigration acts should learn the history of the Windrush generation so that they could be more informed and that presumably would change the behavior. And she, should, she, she should suggested that those operating those laws and, 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 and uh, uh, um, um, enforcing uh, those, those, those strictures should act more humanely in the spirit of the Equality and Human Rights Act. I wrote a paper in response to Williams's report and I called it this, you do not right racial wrongs by doing wrong things more competently. So to end, and I'm sure Luke would be happy to hear that, <laughs> that I'm coming to an end. <laughs> What a, where, where do we go from here? We need to consider against that background, we need to not take the hostile environment as one, if you like, isolated incident in the way in which the British state has responded to us. Yes, it is particular and for those suffering in the way that I have described, it is the only show in town. We know that. But as I tried to explain from the beginning of this presentation, it has its origins since the 1948 Nationality Act, never mind the 1962 Commonwealth Immigrants Act. So, yes, let us concentrate on what is happening to people now as they apply the 2014 and 16 uh, um, um, legislation. But let us also remember the bigger picture. What are the implications of globalization, climate change, the relocation of populations for the way in which this nation state is implementing and, and enacting immigration legislation? What are the implications of all of that for the resurgence of fascism across Europe? What are the implications for us in terms of cross-sectional political organization, especially among the disenfranchised on the axis at least, at least of race and of class. The urgent need to form alliances and recast representative democracy in Britain and Europe. What should that look like for us after we've been dumped upon shat upon from a great height by both the Labour government and the Conservative government since we came here in numbers after the Second World War. What are the implications for concentrating power in the hands of the people? How do we, how do, we do that? And understand that although we accept and, and welcome the fact that we live in a democracy, that democracy does not deliver our rights evenly, equally, or at all in some cases? How do we take charge of our business and hold the state and its institutions to account? Now, I believe that we have the capacity to demonstrate that we have power and that we are prepared to use it. The classic historical precedent of that is the Black People's Day of Action following the New Cross Massacre in 1981, when 20 to 25,000 people took to the streets on an ordinary working Monday to demonstrate to the British state and the British nation 
that we weren't prepared to sit back and allow those things to happen without making our presence felt, our voice felt, and making demands upon the state in relation to our own safety. So how do we gal galvanize our atomized power? In practically every part of uh, uh, the state and its employment structures right now, we have staff networks. We've got black staff networks at universities. We have black, black staff networks in the Crown Prosecution Service, the National Black Police Association, um, black staff networks in the civil service, home office, et cetera, et cetera. Black members in the trade union movement, the National Education Union and so on. They all remain atomized. Why can't we galvanize that power and determine that we would show this country that we are not prepared to sit back and let them treat our people in the way that the hostile environment has been treating our elders? Why can't we shut the damn place down now and then? in a planned systematic manner and become visible by making ourselves invisible. If we don't turn up to work on London transport or on any transport system in the country, if we don't turn up in the National Health Service, if we don't turn up in the civil service, if we don't turn up wherever, on that particular day, we, we would be invisible. But by our absence, we would make ourselves visible and make these people understand that we are not colluding. We are not, by our silence, being complicit in the oppression of us as a people marginalized in this society. So I'm not talking about a go slow. I'm saying, don't go. We don't go to work. We don't go where we're expected to be. And collectively as black people, if we make our presence not felt, or if we make our absence felt, then the whole nation and its apparatuses would have to sit back and take notice. So okay. at the very least, even if we're not bold enough to do all of that, let us for God's sake get together and demand a repeal of the 2014 and 2016 Immigration Acts. I'm absolutely sure that I have run over my time. <laughs> yes. but, but, but I came to take you on a journey. Um, I hope I have done that. And I hope you have been able to stay with me at least part of the way. Thank you. <laughs>